What is up Earth's mightiest subscribers, it's Blurred Without Fear. Welcome back to the channel. All right, today's video, let's ponder the question, who is Man-Thing? Can you see me, you Stevie, wondering how I reach more evolutions than Eevee and make it look easy. Man-Thing, real name, Dr. Theodore Salas, first appeared in Savage Tales number one in 1971 and was created by Steve Gerber, Roy Thomas, Jerry Conway, and Gray Morrow. Dr. Ted Salas, a professor and PhD in biochemistry and well regarded in that field, originally worked for S.H.I.E.L.D. on Project Gladiator, a secret experiment by the United States government to recreate the super soldier serum that turned Steve Rogers into Captain America. But his research kept him so busy that he neglected his wife, Ellen Brandt. In what is easily one of the most petty of spurned lover moves, she ratted out his research to AIM the villainous organization that opposes S.H.I.E.L.D., and she set Ted up to be captured by them and caused him to lose everything he'd ignored her for. As Ted tried to escape before AIM could capture him, he injected himself with the only sample of Project Gladiator that existed just before his getaway car crashed into the Citrusville, Florida swamps. But thanks to the combination of the serum and the mystic energies in the swamp, he was transformed into the seven-foot-tall hulking behemoth Man-Thing. As Man-Thing, Ted is made up entirely of plant life and vegetation held together by mystical energy and mutated swamp water. This makes his body incredibly malleable despite his massive size. He can slip through tight spaces and creases in any environment and manipulate his own size and shape to stretch his arms and legs to reach almost anything he wishes, and he can also turn parts of his body into various weapons too, like blades and bludgeons. He's also capable of massively changing his size from being his normal seven foot tall frame to being as tall or taller than 400 feet. Man-Thing can also regenerate himself at will, using other plant life and vegetation, even able to extend himself or create tendrils to seek out vegetation elsewhere in the world to reform himself. He is also able to manipulate plant life at will, causing vegetation to grow or recede as he sees fit. Ted Salas as Man-Thing is the embodiment of the Earth's life force, and as such, his power is said to be unlimited. He's revered as one of the strongest beings in the Marvel Comics universe, with his strength being depicted as having no limit. He can lift or manipulate anything no matter how dense or heavy he so desires. The only true limit to his strength is who's writing the character at the time. Being made up of plants, he's unaffected by conventional attacks. His form, being as malleable as it is, makes him superhumanly durable. Bullets and kicks and punches typically either pass through him or get stuck within him. He's also surprisingly not weak to fire despite being made up of vegetation. This is due to the moist nature of the swamp plant life that comprises his body. This makes him immune to the effects of fire. One thing many don't associate with Man-Thing is his ability to fly. Speaking of transportation, when he doesn't feel like flying, Man-Thing is fully capable of teleporting wherever he wants, whenever he wants, by creating portals capable of transporting himself and others to where he desires to go, even in the case of places he's never been before. So long as he's shown the location, either by photo or painting or psychic imprint, he can teleport there without error. Speaking of teleportation, Man-Thing is the guardian of the nexus of all realities in the Marvel Comics universe, a cross-dimensional gateway that allows one to access any alternate world in all the known and unknown universe. This nexus is said to have been created during the car crash that turned Ted Salas into Man-Thing. Ted's connection to the Nexus allows him to not only observe other realities, but to open portals to them and travel there as well. And he can also make his own changes to various realities. Case in point, he could take an aspect of Earth 2149, which is the Marvel Zombies universe, and make it part of the Earth 616 universe, which is the main Marvel Comics universe. Or he could even swap different versions of other characters from completely different Earths. He could take the Doctor Doom of Earth 928 and send him to Earth 4289 and vice versa. 
Getting back to Man-Thing's physiology, that is something that has been irrevocably changed by the car crash that created him. Ted's brain is no longer centered in his head, but is evenly distributed across his entire body, explaining why he has such amazing control over all the various portions of his body, and why, even when somehow detached, his various limbs and parts can still move independently. That said, his brain no longer possesses the capacity for empathy, reason, long-term memory, or even thought. Though some of this has been debatable as of late, because while it's always been depicted that he tends to operate on instinct more than anything else, it does seem like over the years, the Man-Thing portion of Ted Salas has begun to change. I'll talk a little bit more about this here in a moment, but based on the original incarnation of Man-Thing, he was superhumanly empathetic due to him feeding on the emotions of any living thing around him. When his surroundings lack emotions to feed on, off of, Ted cannot move, becoming as inert as a statue. When he senses emotions, he naturally moves towards them. Though he does quotey fingers feel things physically, he completely lacks emotions of his own. But the emotions others have around him do dictate how he responds. Angry or otherwise violent emotions or actions around him cause him to attack the source. And as the saying goes, those who know fear burn at the touch of the man thing. This is quite literal. When he senses fear or any other negative emotions, it causes him to exhaust sulfuric acid fumes which burn anyone close to him. And he will endlessly release these sulfuric acid fumes until whatever living thing triggered it no longer emits that negative emotion, which is typically when they're dead. Man thing will relentlessly hunt down any and all sources of fear to make this happen, which makes man thing a more more complicated character since he's typically fairly laid back and docile. To offset the acidic fumes, Man-Thing will secrete a soapy substance that negates the fumes once he's destroyed whatever triggered the reaction. And yes, even detached parts of himself function the same way. If a piece of him is inside a person who is emitting fear or anger or any other negative emotion, regardless of how far away they are from Man-Thing, that part of him will release the same acidic fumes as he would normally. With Man-Thing being a character who has a very strong sense of empathy, it probably wouldn't surprise you to learn that that empathy can be used against him. In 1980's The Savage She-Hulk number 8, when Man-Thing grabbed a hold of Jennifer Walters, his touch initially burned her because she did no fear, but the acid fumes triggered her transformation into She-Hulk, and at the time, She-Hulk felt so much rage, it overwhelmed Man-Thing and rendered him unconscious. That said, Hulks do tend to have a bit of a resistance to the Man-Thing's touch. We've actually seen over the course of Man-Thing's publication history that not only has his touch seemingly been ineffective against She-Hulk, we've also seen it be effective against Betty Ross when she was the Red She-Hulk, and we've even seen it work to a pretty sizable degree against Bruce Banner's Hulk. And while in both instances it didn't kill them, it burned them enough to show that they weren't fully invulnerable to it. On a sidebar, Man-Thing's touch, when he's not burning someone alive, has actually been proven to be quite soothing. We saw this in X-Force number 100 when Man-Thing put his hand towards Danny Moonstar's face, and it's revealed that his touch is is Quotey Fingers unexpectedly calming? Man-Thing's only true weakness is that he must be connected to the Citrusville Swamp in Florida that created him. He doesn't have to be there all the time, though, but he can't be away from the swamp for long periods of time. Otherwise, he will become involuntarily dormant. Now, earlier, I mentioned Man-Thing lacks the ability to communicate or think or feel emotions. And originally, when Ted Salas became Man-Thing, this was true. But it was later revealed he actually does does speak using a language referred to as Excelsior, a universal language that allows whoever he speaks with to understand him in a way that best suits them. In the case of characters like Ghost, regardless of what Man-Thing actually said, everything came out to 
ghost as if it were short and to the point because that is what ghost preferred. But to someone like Boomerang, Man-Thing spoke like a common street thug. But to Mr. Hyde, Man-Thing sounded like an English gentleman. And to the likes of Satana and Moonstone, Man-Thing sounded like whatever their idea of a quotey fingers normal person sounds like. Going back to Man-Thing's past for a second, many forget that he was best friends with Spider-Man villain Dr. Kurt Connors, aka the Lizard. They worked together on Project Gladiator, and part of the serum that turned Ted into Man-Thing was the result of the earliest versions of Connor's own formula that eventually turned him into the Lizard. Despite Man-Thing's solitary nature, he was briefly a member of the Midnight Suns during the Doctor Strange story arc Damnation. He's also been a member of the Thunderbolts, the Howling Commandos, and the all-new Howling Commandos. He's also been a member of Avengers of the Supernatural, Natural, stake, shield, during his time before becoming Man-Thing, the Ancient Order of the Shield, the Daydreamers, and the Legion of Monsters. He's also been a member of Weapon Plus, though this was while he was being mind-controlled. Man-Thing also moonlights at the Strange Academy as an 8th period botany teacher. Despite being highly sought after, no different than Bigfoot or the Loch Ness Monster, Man-Thing is also considered to be make-believe by the general public. Few people actually know who he really is and even less believe he's actually real, outside of those who have met him face to face. Now that I've said all this, I want to address the elephant that's been sitting in the room since the start of this video. Yes, many people assume Man-Thing is a ripoff of the DC Comics character Swamp Thing. This isn't actually true. Swamp Thing released at DC Comics in July of 1971 in House of Secrets number 92. Man-Thing debuted in Savage Tales number one in May of 1971. So technically, Man-Thing was first. But truth be told, both Man-Thing and Swamp Thing creators were copying another hero altogether, The Heap, who Man-Thing co-creator Roy Thomas was a huge fan of. For those unfamiliar, The Heap was an Eclipse Comics character from the 1940s that first appeared in Air Fighters Comics number 3 in 1942. The character of Man-Thing has a lot of similarities to The Heap, who was a German fighter pilot shot down over a swamp in Poland and he died of his injuries from the crash and eventually his body merged with the vegetation of the swamp and his will to live persisted over the course of almost 25 years eventually willing himself back to life, not as a human, but as the blood-drinking humanoid plant, the Heap, a character Man-Thing has a striking resemblance to. So yes, Man-Thing is not that original of a concept, which makes Swamp Thing, a character whose origin isn't that far off from Man-Thing's even less original. Another interesting wrinkle to all of this is the reason that Man-Thing and Swamp Thing are so close in likeness and origin is because Man-Thing co-creator Jerry Conway and Swamp Thing co-creator Lynn Wine were roommates at the time they were both working for Marvel and DC Comics respectively. It's largely believed that the only reason Marvel never pursued legal action against DC Comics for this mix-up is because of how closely Man-Thing resembled Eclipse Comics' The Heap. Now, getting away from all that, while this isn't a subject that is often talked about, Man-Thing does actually have children, one of which I hinted at earlier when talking about his origin, a son named Job Burke with his ex-wife Ellen Brandt, who was pregnant around the time that Ted Salas had become Man-Thing. Job's a child who seems to have some level of power over reality, though he tends to use this ability subconsciously with no real idea of how to control it. There's also Boy Thing, a piece of Man-Thing that was cut away and manipulated by Dracula's son, Zarus, into a miniature version of Man-Thing and wielded as a weapon. Boy Thing would eventually become allies with the vampire hunter Blade instead. It seems he possesses the same exact abilities as Man-Thing. 
And while many may believe that Man-Thing's first time being in live action was on the recently released Disney Plus special, Werewolf by Night, where he's portrayed by both Carrie Jones in motion capture and voiced by Jeffrey Ford, he's actually been depicted in live action before this in 2005's Man-Thing film. Many people may remember this as a Sci-Fi Channel original movie when it released and is technically the last film ever produced by Artisan Entertainment. With that out of the way, let's get into some recommended reading. I'm going to recommend that you read Savage Tales number one for Man-Thing's first appearance, and I'll also recommend you check out Adventures into Fear number 10 through 19 to get more of a deeper look at Man-Thing's day-to-day life after becoming a monster. I'll also recommend you check out the Marvel Max miniseries Dead of Night featuring Man-Thing to see various tales about Man-Thing and see him in kind of an entirely different light as he's depicted as more of an actual horror movie style monster. I'll also recommend you check out Thunderbolts number 144 through 145 to get an idea of what Man-Thing is like when you actually get to see what it is he's talking about. If you want to see Man-Thing going through an existential crisis, I highly recommend you check out Man-Thing by R.L. Stein, number one through five. And last but not least, if you really want to get up to speed on Man-Thing's current status quo, check out the Curse of the Man-Thing miniseries, which are three separate one-shots of Avengers, Spider-Man, and X-Men. Man-Thing is a character that I don't really ever think about very often, but is a character I'm always happy to see when I actually see him, similar to how I feel about the character Elsa Bloodstone, as I mentioned in my recent video about that character. He's somebody who I've never ever really been checking for, but whenever I read a story that has him in it, I'm always intrigued. Because Man-Thing is just such a force of nature, and while I do enjoy the Thunderbolts iteration of him where you could actually see what it was he was talking about, I actually do prefer it when you don't really know what Man-Thing is saying and people are just responding to whatever. It's kind of like the Chewbacca or R2-D2 effect. You don't know what they're saying, but you get an idea roughly just based on how people respond to them. And I think with the introduction of him into the MCU in the Werewolf by Night Halloween special, I think a lot more people are going to start warming up to this character and wanting to learn so much more about him. If you want to know more about characters like Elsa Bloodstone or the Werewolf by Night, check out these videos right here. And in the meantime, let me know what you think about the Marvel Comics character, Man-Thing. Have you always known about him or are you today years old finding out about him? Keep it plus ultra and sound off in the comments.